Um, please join me in welcoming Joss Whedon. the ones that did not stand. <laughs> That's what happened to your families. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Can I, feedback I think I am. I'm fixing it. So, right. so um, I actually, I had some questions about some of your earlier projects, but I, I certainly want to start with this one. Um, as I think it has to be a, a, certainly a very unique uh, decision as a follow-up to the third highest grossing film of all time, a, you know, a, a black and white Shakespeare film. Um, can you maybe just talk about, you know, why, the, why Shakespeare? I mean, what, well, what is the relationship with the Avengers and, and how did this project come about? Um, power has driven me mad. Uh, no, um, uh, Shakespeare uh, is just, has been a part of the fabric of my life for all of my life, and it's something that I love very much. And um, we, uh, The Avengers wasn't the third highest grossing movie of all time. When we shot this, The Avengers uh, had, fin had wrapped a month before. So we were just at the beginning of editing The Avengers when we did this. And when, um, I did it because uh, my wife uh, and I had a vacation planned, and she said, you know what, let's not travel, you need to relax, you should make another movie. <laughs> and, um, you know, and everything was in place and had been for some time. We'd been doing readings at the house, and so I already knew who my Beatrice and Benedict were. Uh, my wife had built the house, so I already knew where Leonardo's estate was. Um, she even had a crew for another thing that she was putting together for our production company. And um, so it really, the only excuse I had not to make it was sanity or n that I didn't have a take on the text, and I had sort of shied away from it for a long time because of that. And then I, I really dug into it as I was finishing up the event, filming the Avengers and went, oh no, this, I know exactly what I want to say about this text and then it's a movie. So it just seemed perfectly natural, like anybody would do that. There was a point at which I realized, oh my God, my personal issues are hilarious. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, that, and, then, and then I thought, maybe I should edit it too. <laughs> oh God, what have I done? I'll write the music. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mm. But it's, um, why this text? Uh, I mean, because I, I, I'd read about these, you know, these readings that you've had at your house where you just call your friends over and you just read plays of Shakespeare, which just sounds so sophisticated. Um, <laughs> I, I don't do anything like that at my house. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so I'm assuming that it was a, a number of plays, but why Much Ado About Nothing? Was there something specifically about this text and you said, this is the one that I want to do? Is it because that there one you could shoot in your house? Or? There are other ones that could be, you know, that I would love to do, Twelfth Night and Hamlet, Othello. There's, 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 a, there's scads. He wrote a bunch of good plays. Um, <laughs> he, he'll go far. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, Much Ado, we did look at for practical purposes. It's like, I, I know who I want to be in it. I know that it's all in one location. I know that location so well that I already understand the feeling of the film. Um, you know, those practical considerations were the difference between we can do this in a month and we can't. Um, so there are other texts that I care about as much. Um, this one came at me more subtly because I'd always enjoyed it as a comedy, but I hadn't really understood about the sort of, not just the dark underbelly of it, but the fact that all of the stuff that you usually just sit through to get back to Beatrice and Benedict is actually very interesting. And that the characters, you know, even though they may themselves be a bit dim, Claudio, um, <laughs> uh, they themselves have integrity and they're very much a part of what Shakespeare is trying to say. And, uh, you know, did you have sort of a long desire to do an adaptation of Shakespeare? I know that, you know, with your, with your television work, I think that would probably give you opportunities to cross things off your list. You, know, you can say, I can do a silent, I can do a musical, I can do puppets. Uh, was there, you know, I, I've always wanted to do Shakespeare, and so this was kind of something that you were waiting on doing. Well, you know, I mean, I guess Moonlighting did that, didn't they? They did, they did the Taming of the Shrew episode. Um, uh, years before, but it never occurred to me to try and do Shakespeare, except that when I first met Amy Acker, um, I was completely blown away by her, but I, was, I had been burned before by people who are great in the room. 
And so we did a film test. Like two days later, I got Alexis and J. August Richards, and we filmed a little scene just to make sure. And it was basically Midsummer. It was basically they, they're under a spell, and they fall in love with her in a flowery Elizabethan way, and they're both acting like idiots. And um, so I, it turned out to be more prophetic than I expected. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably come back to this when we uh, open it up to the audience with questions, but uh, as this is the, the film society, I'm, I'm actually very interested in, in you know, your transition as a young writer uh, to, to getting into film. Uh, your, your first work, uh, it was a television job, I, mean, I, I think it's Roseanne, is, is that correct? Or, yeah, that was my first job. So was, was that, did you always want to do television? I know that you come from a television family, or did you, did you go out to Hollywood to work in film or television? How did that work? I would never do television. I was, uh, that was beneath me. <laughs> I studied film. <laughs> And my, and my best friend's senior year used to taunt me. He was like, you're going to be a third generation television writer. I'm like, I am not. Quit. It's like 3GTV. <laughs> you call me that all the time. Um, and then I, you know, I, I got out to, to Hollywood and discovered an incredible lack of money. And um, <laughs> so I sort of started poking my nose around and then realized, oh, there's some very good television that's being made. And... And as soon as I started writing it, it was really the first writing I'd ever done. Over my television specs that I wrote trying to get a job, and, and that's when I fell in love with writing, was through television. So, and I had the privilege to work on Roseanne, which was, you know, a, a, the best show on. I mean, really, it, uh, it had a level of reality that no other show was really busting out just then. Mm -hmm. But you didn't do a lot of television, television before um, moving on to film. I mean, in some of your credits, you know, you'd done script doctoring work, and then, you know, you had written Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and you had written, um, you know, you'd done some uncredited work on Speed and um, and Toy Story. You know, so that's you know not a not a bad resume. The most, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it was there was a period where because I had written, I had started Buffy before I ever worked on anything. It was the first script I ever wrote, and um, uh, and I finished it while I was sitting around Roseanne not doing anything going, well, I don't want to be paid to do nothing. So where did, by the way, I got over that. <laughs> what, what? That's just, I can't, who was that young man? That rash young man, he had how? I don't know, I recognize him. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, I, so I was working on, on the Buffy script and at some point, you know, I, I was, TV was starting to go well, but it was, it was kind of a disaster on Roseanne and Parenthood. It was a good showrunner, good cast, also a disaster. And, you know, I was getting tired of it. And then there was this thing of, oh, you know, um, uh, we might be able to get this movie made. And my agent pleaded with me, he's like, don't leave television and do Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And then I did, and then I got from having done that and a couple other things, Speed and Alien, and I started to get a lot of work as, as um, uh, as a screenwriter, and then about four years later, my agent begged me, don't leave the movies and make Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> so I don't know, listen to him. <laughs> but th that actually isn't interesting, not to, to bring up maybe a, a, a bad memory, but um, you know, you've always, I've, reading interviews, you, you've always been very candid about um, sort of your, your reaction to some of the, the end products of scripts that you had written where you were sort of less than pleased with the result, uh, you know, with, with, with Buffy, for instance, and uh, specifically with, with Alien Resurrection. Um, you know, Billy Wilder tells a story about um, when he was a screenwriter on, on the set of Hold Back the Dawn uh, and, and watching the director, what in his estimation was just butchering his script, and he sort of had this come to Jesus moment where he said, okay, that's it, I'm a director now. Um, did you have that during those projects? I mean, was there a point where you said, I can't, I can't do this anymore, I have to direct myself? Yeah, I mean, I, I always wanted to. I've got, there are some writers who only are script protectors, who only go into directing because they're sick of seeing it wrong. But they don't necessarily care so much about the visual aspect of storytelling, whereas when I'm writing a script, I'm directing it. In my mind, I know exactly how it's supposed to be, and I try to make it read like it's going to look. Um, it's very much a, a combination of you know, words and, and, and pictures from the start. So it was something that I wanted very much, but yes, a certain amount of umbrage, a certain amount of you know, um, heartbreak, uh, the script doctoring and, and working as a screenwriter was, was killing me. Um, I was doing very well and I was dying. And I finally just said the next moron who ruins one of my scripts is gonna be me. <laughs> 
but um, nobody would hire me. Um, and that was part of why I created Buffy. I was like, well, I'll hire me. <laughs> but was that, was that something that you wanted to do? Was there a desire to go to TV? Or did the, the WB approached you about that show? I mean, they but was, did, that, yeah, was, was Buffy it? something that you were, you were always wanting to bring back and then... No, no, you know, I'd, I'd let go because, uh, you know, we went to the premiere and sort of sat there and afterwards my wife said, well, you know, maybe in four, three or four years they'll let you make it your way. I said, you know nothing about Hollywood. <laughs> And um, so I had sort of just moved on, because you have to, and, and it was Gail Berman who had the idea this could be a series. I think when they first pitched it to me, it was a half-hour afternoon Power Rangers type series. <laughs> that was the first pitch. And I sort of went, yeah, but what if? <laughs> and you know, by the time I pitched it to the agent to whom I said, just told you I don't listen, he was the one who said, well, that's an hour drama. That's not a half-hour show. And so it, you know, and he was like, but you sure you want to do this? I'm like, I'm already writing it. And he's like, okay, I know, he knows what that means. It's like, when I can't stop it, he can't stop it. And that, I mean, and that seemed, it, it changed everything. I mean, and then you're just sort of, uh, you know, just show after show, um, just these great critically acclaimed um, shows. And, um, it, and that's leading you back into film with, you know, the, the, the early cancellation of Firefly and, and really this, um, this rabid support of the, the people who love that show and this is how your, your second directed movie happens um, with, with Serenity and, and, and was that, that was your entry. I mean, did you plan on, on going back into film and then did, did the Firefly experience kind of force your hand and then you were directing a movie again? Yeah, I mean, I had always intended to shoot a movie. Uh, you know, that was sort of the end game. It's not, you know, there is no end game now. I want to just sort of do everything, um, and, uh, which means that I will never be great at anything, but I'll have lots of fun. Um, but then be terrified a lot, which is, I think, very healthy. But with that, you know, I, 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 Firefly was, for me, um, unendurable, uh, because I'd made a show, and it was hard to get it on the air, but it got on the air, and it went, and that's how it, and that happened. And then I did it again. And it got on the air, and people liked it, and went, and it's really great. And so I thought, that's how it happened. I thought, that's, you know, that's, what, that's how it goes. And then I made a show that I knew. You know, Buffy and Angel both had to evolve into themselves a little bit. Um, Firefly sprung fully armored from Seuss's head. It was exactly the show I wanted it to be the moment I started. And so to have it ripped, you know, untimely from the womb um, was not... Uh, it was just not acceptable to me. I felt not only this incredible loss, but that I had lied to the actors, that I had let them down, that I had told them, if it's good and you're good, then everything will be fine. And, um, uh, and I, I've never, I've always sort of taken what's given me and gone, okay, thank you, I'll do what I can with that. I've never bucked the system. When I worked under terrible directors, I never said, you're a terrible director, step aside, we've got to change things here, because that's not how it works. For me, it's like the army. Like, I entered it always saying, you know, he can be Henry Fonda, because one day I'm going to be John Wayne. That's Fort Apache. <laughs> <laughs> he can't be, like, once upon a time in the West, Henry Fonda. That's not okay. But, um, uh, you know, it's like, I'm going to take orders from him so that one day I can give orders. And, um, uh, and so I was, I was very strict about that. But with Firefly, I... I snapped. I was like, We're not, this doesn't go away. And I got all my people together and I was like, we, there's no, I will not, I will not, I cannot sleep, I cannot live until we find another venue for this. And, um, and I was a little, a little more fierce than I usually am. Luckily, Mary Parent at Universal is just like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, okay. So that's how that works. So, and um, I just, I want to read a, a quote of yours that you had said about um, Serenity. You know, uh, a lot of things didn't happen in this movie because I had two hours instead of seven seasons. So, um, and you know, when you look at the, the, you know, your work as a, as a comic writer, you know, Buffy has continued in comics, Angel has continued in comics, and Firefly has a little, but it seems that the output has been less, and it's, it's, one could assume that you're, you're leaving open the possibility that there's something that can still happen with this. Um, I know you probably get this question a thousand times and I apologize, but just with, um, you know, and I understand that the budget of a Veronica Mars is much different than oh, the budget this of Serenity. <laughs> but I, I prefaced it with an apology so you can't get mad. No, uh, but I, but, that's, but I'm, I'm sorry, that's the rule. I, I don't write it, but that's the rule. But so. I can't interrupt you. I'm not going to do that. 
Mm -hmm. um, maybe one day I will. Um, maybe one day uh, someone will, a studio will actually want me to. Maybe one day we'll all get together and want to kickstart something. But right now, everybody is, I'm happy to say, working very hard in very good jobs. Um, and, you know, I, there's a real fear of, of, you know, the monkey's paw, where you bring it back to life and it isn't the same. I mean, even if it's great and it isn't the same. And um, so right now it's, you know, I, I'm dying to get on a ship with those guys again, but I'm also doing yet another goddamn huge ensemble movie. <laughs> uh, why I, I can't just make a movie about one guy <laughs> ever. Um, with, and so right now I'm just, I can't, I can't even access that part of my brain. But I'm also the guy who said, well, I'll never have anything to do with Buffy again. So, I mean, you know, if all, all, if all the planets align, that would be great. But I d I'm not going to do what I did the first time and move heaven and earth to make it happen because I just don't have that. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it, you can't force it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to open this up to the, uh, to the audience. I'm sure we have some questions. Um, I'm going to start with you, Miss, with the glasses. Uh, the first, first one, if, I'm, if I can paraphrase, is, um, you know, you, you, had, you know, you were a writer and then you did a director and then you were an editor. So what, what new skills are next on your list of things that you would like to conquer in film or television? Um, right, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, probably not film or television. I, you know, I would, I'm dying to, uh, I, I, uh, there's a ballet that I would like to make. <laughs> and um, uh, and, uh, and the, three, the three people who are going to see it uh, <laughs> uh, will love it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I don't really, I can't really play music and I want to sort of, you know, I want to do a full length musical. There's books that I want to write. There's so many things that, you know, that I, I'm excited about that I want to do. There, there are more movies, obviously, and more TV and, you know, I, you know, I still haven't made enough spaceship movies. You can't ever make enough spaceship movies because um, they have spaceships in them. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's so, it, it, everything, um, and, you know, it, and, but some of them will have to be the tiny things because seriously, I would, only I would hire me as a composer. Um, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's okay though. Um, so anything that terrifies me. And I'm sorry, there was a, there was a part two. Yeah, you know, um, uh, really the only things I directed that uh, I hadn't written at all were episodes of The Office and Glee because I loved those shows and I knew the people who were doing them. And, and um, I was going to say I had free time, but I'm pretty sure I mean my career was on the skids. Um, but, uh, um, and, uh, uh, I, but something like The Avengers been cast, that there's a whole, you know, there's a huge history that I, that I know, and, and, and um, it's, it's all, you know, you, if you can't find your own way in, then you just don't do it. Um, the fact of the matter is, because I've been a script doctor, because I've been a showrunner, I was used to coming in where things were already set. After the pilot of a show, everything, a lot of the work's been done, and you're, you know, you're interpreting what, what you've got there. When you come in as a script doctor, you know, they're like, and then it goes into a plane. I'm like, I have a way better idea. They're like, we already bought the plane. <laughs> okay, I know, it's good, I'm gonna make it work. We're gonna work with the plane, it's good, it's a good idea. Um, so, you know, you just sort of, you have to, you know, you find the heart of the thing, you find your heart of the thing. With Marvel, I said, look, I know what you want. This is what I want. I wanna make a war movie. I wanna make The Dirty Dozen, I wanna make Black Hawk Down, I don't wanna make a squeaky clean, perfect, I want to take a toll on these guys. And they're like, we get that, we love it. Do it in the mighty Marvel manner, and everybody wins. Um, so we knew going in, you know, that I had my obsessions and that they fit in that universe. With this, you know, it's a question of, you know, interpreting his work the way I would, which is in a depressing fashion. 
Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to fall in love with something. What, the entire world is covered with water? I include me in. Um, and yes, you can get heartbroken, but, uh, but you have to start that way. And, and uh, the parameters, they always exist. If you're doing a genre, if you're doing, you know, it's a comedy, they must laugh. Already, you know, the page is not totally blank. So how much of it is filled in, whether it's completely written like this, whether it's, um, you know, whether there are a lot of elements that are set like the Avengers or whether it's a show that's yours, but it's been on for three years. Um, you know, you always have to find the new way in. Um, okay, uh, yes, you, sir. So the, the question was about your decision to, I'm just so everybody can hear it in the back. Um, the question is about your decision to, uh, it's, it's contemporary uh, in set, but the language is the same in that decision. Um, let's just get, let's cut to the second one. I don't have any good advice. Okay. <laughs> My advice is if you write something, shoot it. Because you can now. And when I started, you couldn't. Um, that's, my, that's, that's my biggest advice. That's the best I got. I've had people come and say, can you give me any advice that isn't that advice you always give about shooting it? But really, that's what I got. Um, yeah, she was really popular. Um, but, uh, and, you know, I actually think 10 Things I Hate About You is pretty great. But I would never uh, want to make a, an updating of a Shakespeare plot. That's not, you know, uh, bless his heart, the plot is not the reason we're there. It's, it's the humanity and more than anything, it's those words. The music of those words, the life in them, the character. Um, I would never touch them. I cut some of them and I changed one of them. Um, I decided in my infinite wisdom that it might be more sympathetic if Benedict did not say, if I do not love her, I am a Jew. <laughs> So I decided to change it to, if I do not love her, I am a black guy. But then I thought, no, that's not gonna work either. So um, I changed it to fool. But no, his words are, were the thing that brought us all together. Um, they were the thing that you know, have, have sustained over um, 400 years in different countries and different cultures and different modes of speaking and different accents and different, it all fits, it all works because the stuff is so resonant and human. Um, the modern dress thing is, A, because I wanted to capture some of the sort of casual intimacy of the readings themselves. I wanted people to be able to have a, a way in, that it wasn't, you know, giant starch collars and, and, and doublet and hose, and, and you're already going, hmm. Board costumes. <laughs> and oh, I already did give you advice, so we're done. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, let me, maybe get something a little further back in the, uh, the house. I see a hand there with a man in a tie. Um, uh, so I just have two questions. Uh, first of all, Everybody's got two. Uh, Go ahead and clap, yeah, I am. So, uh, two questions, which I'll repeat. So, question one was, uh, have you ever been approached or have you ever considered adapting uh, a video game, which is uh, quite popular right now? I've been approached a few times. Um, and, uh, and I've sort of gone down the path a little bit and then it's never amounted to anything. Um, I still don't understand why they never made a Firefly game. Uh, because it lends itself enormously. They were going to do a big, multi, massive multiplayer thingy with many M's in the acronym. I don't know what it's called, okay? I'm old. Look at me, for God's sake. I have reading glasses. But, um, uh, you know, I, at first, was not interested in video games just because there, there really was no sort of narrative. There was no character. There was no sort of decision making. It was just bang, bang. And that's really changed. And it's become more and more interesting and more and more the form of storytelling that, that a lot of people are, are gravitating towards. My problem is uh, I don't play them. Um, because, uh, you know, there's video games, there's a career, and there's a family pick too. <laughs> and, um, and so I really just, I just never sort of got the hang of them. 
as my nephews found out when they tried to play uh, Gears of War with me, and I suddenly wasn't the cool uncle anymore, <laughs> as I kept shooting them by mistake. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and yes, Patton Oswalt's uh, famous filibuster is, it's, you know, a timeless piece of joy. Um, yes, Miss. So I've always admired that when people would ask you about why you create strong female characters, that you'd just be like, well, that question exists. Um, and so you probably get all these annoying questions like Kickstarter. So my question hey. is... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, that's a great question and I don't have an answer for it. It's so annoying because every now and then someone says that and it's like, when I was young, I used to get like a gift certificate to the record store. Records were big round things. And, um, uh, and the moment I'd go into the record store, I'd be like, I don't remember any music ever. And when somebody says, hey, you know, Desert Island, books, what, I'm like, what's a book? I just panic. Uh, what question do I wish I'd been asked? Um, no, yeah, I got nothing. Yeah, which is related but I like, couldn't think of anything specific. <laughs> you know, do you, your, do you use your powers for good or awesome? Um, and it would be it. No, I really got nothing. Sorry. This is great. Isn't this fun? A Q and not A. Uh, yes, sir. I'm a big fan of uh, your run on Astonishing X-Men and Avengers. Talks a great big Marvel fan. Um, you said you had to do Avengers the mighty Marvel way. If you could do any Marvel character or movie, whatever studio it was in, is there a Marvel character uh, that you wish you could do? <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, I'm going I'm to try that one again. Um, is there a character in the Marvel Universe that you would like to bring to some medium that you have not yet? Better. Um, that hasn't been? Or that... You know, if I could get my hand, if I get, could get my mitts on absolutely anybody, it would be uh, Batman. <laughs> Who, let's face it, is the Marvel character in the DC universe. And if I could do any, probably Thor. I mean, let's face it, those arms. <laughs> um, yes, Smith. What draws you to tragic romance? Uh, that's the nicest way that's question ever been asked. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I am draw. I am draw of them. I don't. I have a particular disconnect from the human condition, wherein I don't necessarily understand happiness and romance. I experience them, but I can't really communicate them, and I don't really. I think there, it's, it's going to be taken away from me at any moment. Um, and uh, so I, and some, you know, I'm probably telling you way too much, but I it just, I have a real um, uh, just disconnect from that idea. The other thing that, you know, um, you have to remember is we're talking about television. So we're talking about um, people uh, who, you know, Nobody wants to see a happy couple, <laughs> honestly. And I thought I'd cured that with Zoe and Wash. And I thought the one thing we're never gonna do, they're never gonna have an affair, they're never gonna get divorced, nobody's gonna die, this is gonna be a real marriage. Um, you may have noticed <laughs> that certain things changed. And they changed because you know I was making a movie instead of the series that I had, had led to make. And, um, and by the way, that was the last disagreement I had before they picked up the pilot when they said, we'll pick up the pilot, but we don't want Zoe and Wash to be married. And I said, then don't pick up the pilot. And, and then they called back later and said, okay. <laughs> don't be married. Uh, but, yes. Um, sorry. One of the things I thought was really great about this is the kind of like the little ballet of the camera work. 
way the camera moves here and moves there and all. And it's like I was just sort of following that. And I, and I thought that had an epic quality. I wanted you to talk about how you, even though it's in this intimate setting and they're in modern dress, you created this epic quality by kind of cutting back and forth and showing things from it. And how you planned it. And was it at all structurally like how you would plan uh, a, a Mary Marvel Marching Society film? Um, uh, it's funny, the word epic is not one that I use about this movie a lot. Um, and as far as the cameras dancing, uh, that usually meant panning because we didn't have any uh, equipment. Um, we had about three moving shots, uh, two on a butt dolly, and which is basically just an awesome stool, and, uh, uh, and one on a blanket. It was also the editing Yes, well. <laughs> Myself and young Daniel Kaminsky. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, there's so much to shoot in that, in that space. It's one of the reasons I love it so much. There are so many vistas and connections. And, um, you know, putting the actors in it, it, inevitably, everywhere you looked, there was something a little bit extraordinary. And, um, uh, and so it was uh, kind of hard not to. Um, you know, give it this sort of grand quality. But uh, for me, it was always about, you know, wh where, what do I need to see from them? You know, and, and where we framed them was important, but we were never gonna like destroy the, uh, the integrity of the scene to get it. Uh, it really was, let's run three cameras as much as we can, two almost all the time, so that the most important thing was getting a performance that as often as possible ran from the beginning of the scene to the end. Like, you know, we would shoot more than one take, sometimes many, many more. The wedding scene, we had about two and a half hours of footage just of the wedding in the atrium, uh, in the amphitheater. And, um, uh, but it was, you know, we wanted to capture the performance going through. That was sort of the, my biggest thing. And then there was some, <coughs> excuse me, you know, some, some, visual ideas I had beyond that, but for me, the main thing was to, for us to be standing in the room with these people. Um, and that uh, sort of dictated everything after. Okay, uh, I've been favoring the front, so let me go to the back a little bit. I see um, a red shirt, I think, a reddish. Yeah, yeah that's you. And so continues, <laughs> the Q and not A. <laughs> That's not something I can really talk about. But Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are going to be in the movie, and they're going to be awesome. I think we are running on time, so I have one more. So if you're confident, keep your hand up, because it better be a good one. Um, I'm going to go with this one right here. So much confidence. <laughs> Not really. I mean, uh, there's always, you know, there's always more at the well when, when you've been, uh, when, you know, you've been suddenly canceled. Um, but, um, uh, but when we were in the thick of it, you know, we, we always had license to go out further and, and, and to explore all the characters and change things up and see, oh, you know, that guy shines, let's bring him back, let's see more. So, I mean, the great thing about television is that you get to do that with movies. You know, I mean, and I think Serenity is a good example of that. It's sort of, we had to suck out a lot of the subtlety and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the relationships. And in both uh, Avengers and um, Serenity, there were characters who had a deep, important, and loving history who never spoke to each other in the entire movie. Uh, Inara and, and uh, Kaylee never speak, um, and uh, the Black Widow and Nick Fury never speak. I mean, I think he points to her once and says, go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, but it's just, you know, it's, and so it's, it's this distillation, whereas with TV, that's sort of the point, is like, let's get to know more, and let's find new places to go with these people. Um, if you're working with actors for that long, you just, you know, you want to honor the th exciting things you've seen about them, and also you don't want them to get bored, because it'll show. 
Um, I think this corpse is dead. <laughs> well, um, Much Ado About Nothing opens June 7th. Uh, Joss Whedon, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you.